When it comes to art, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. But has today's culture taken that idea too far? Today, I'll be giving my opinion on the contrasting dynamics of classical and modern art. I'm Julie Hartman, and this is Timeless. <laughs> Hey everyone, welcome to Timeless. I hope that you're having a great week. Just a reminder to hit the subscribe button down below so that you can stay notified every time I post a Julie Noted vi News video or a Timeless episode. And also be sure to follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Julie R. Hartman. I will also take this opportunity to tell you to please follow Dennis, uh, follow, excuse me, Dennis on Instagram and Twitter at the Dennis Prager. God knows Dennis will not publicize his Instagram on his show because probably sometimes he forgets he has it, but I do not forget and thus that is why I am relaying this information to you. So today we are going to be talking about art. Now those of you who have been watching Timeless know that I actually did an art episode a few months ago with the great Robert Florzak, who is a classical art expert as well as an artist himself. He actually designed the logo of uh, Michael Jackson's Neverland Ranch, and also he has work that is in the private collections of AT&T, which is really cool, as well as I think Mel Gibson as well some really uh, uh, high level companies and individuals have bought and displayed his art. Anyway, I had him on this show a few months ago and I asked him to please provide me with five paintings that he, as the art expert, thinks that everyone ought to know about. And we had a really, really fun discussion. I highly encourage all of you to check it out. The episode is called The Art of Art. So this is kind of a timeless art episode 2.0. And I really credit Robert Florzak in that episode that we filmed a few months ago for alerting me to the beauty and magnificence of classical art. I once wrongly thought that you had to be an expert on the painting, the artist, the subject matter, the time in which it was created in order to appreciate that painting. Sometimes I would go into museums and I would look and I would go, I have no idea what that's depicting. How can I appreciate this if I'm in the dark as to what the subject matter is? Robert Florzak in that episode, you can literally see me being influenced on camera for the hour. He upended that view that I had. He showed me, no, you don't need to know anything about the subject matter or the artist or the time in which it was created to, to appreciate the piece. Look at the way that the artist paints light. Look at the lines and shading and color that the artist use. Look at the way that the artist depicts human beings. A lot of classical art is extremely realistic that sometimes you even forget that it's a painting. So since that episode, I've gained a new appreciation of art. I've actually spent a lot of my free time looking at art and I've developed some opinions about the differences of classical and modern art that I want to share with you today. Later in this episode, I'm going to give you three reasons as to why I prefer classical over modern art. And as you will see, I kind of root that in a values or morality based argument. So we will get to that. But before I go to my subjective take of good and not so good art, let's first start with an objective, quick review of the history of the evolution of art, which in itself is really interesting and informative. So before the modern art push, and I'm going to pinpoint when I think the quote unquote modern art push happened, there was an emphasis on art that was realistic and art that depicted stories, things that could inspire and motivate the viewer. And often these stories were biblical stories or stories from literature and from mythology. So those are really the two components of what art consisted of prior to the modern push. So there was first the medieval art period, which was from about the year 500 to 1400. And I'm going to be pulling up examples of each of these eras to show you what they valued and then how the next era kind of evolved. So this medieval art area, or era, excuse me, I keep calling eras areas. <laughs> like the other day on Timeless, I said, what did I say, Sean? Shakespeare, I said Shakespeare. We got to do a, a, a blooper compilation one of these days. But let's look at a painting from the medieval era, <laughs> which is called the first picture 
of Christ's birth. This goes back to the 1400s. We actually don't know who the artist was of this magnificent painting, but we see a theme here that is emblematic of a lot of the art during that time in that it is magisterial. It's awe-inspiring. You see Christ right there after he was born, sitting on his mother's lap, Mother Mary, who's adorned in this beautiful blue, and he has his hand on what I presume is his father, Joseph. So you can see that this little baby Christ is Christ-like because already he kind of has this touch of healing. And you see all of these individuals who are there in Bethlehem after Christ was born and they're ooing and aahing, they're fawning over the birth of this uh, particularly important child. You even see some of the animals that are turning around and looking or, and have their ears up because they are so interested in this baby being born. And you just get a sense from the story that this was a really important moment. Of course, if you're Christian and looking at this piece of art, it's very important um, and moving to you. But even if you're not a Christian and you look at that piece of art, you're getting something out of it because you know that is a story that has been instrumental in Western civilization. So we see here that art in the medieval era, era was trying to impart something to you, whether it was a lesson, whether it was to move you, or just highlight a story that is of particular cultural importance. We now know that modern art really doesn't do that, but we will, of course, get to that. So that's the medieval period. Then, starting in about 1400 and for two centuries, so from 1400 to 1600, we move into the Renaissance period. This period also wanted to depict magisterial moments or scenes of importance, mostly from uh, literature or from history. But we see that in the Renaissance era, the priority more than anything else is making realistic depictions of human beings and of our surroundings. Look at the School of Athens, for instance, by Raphael. He painted this, this magnificent painting in uh, the 16th century. Each of those figures that we see has perfect proportions. They look exactly like human beings. Even if you go back to the uh, picture of uh, the first picture of Christ's birth, the medieval painting that I showed you. Yes, the human beings are clearly human beings, but they don't look as realistic as they do in the School of Athens during the Renaissance period. The Renaissance was characterized by high standards of form and drawing. They wanted to make everything realistic. Even if you look at the arches, that are behind the figures in the foreground of this painting, which by the way, the main figures are Plato and Aristotle who are in the center. Even if you look at the arches behind them, do you know how hard that is to do from a technical painting standpoint to make things look like they are far away? If you look at old cave paintings, when people wanted to make something look far away or in the distance, they painted it above the main people in the foreground. Somehow these Renaissance painters, by uh, adhering to scrupulous standards, by going into these salons and these painting uh, education programs, really figured out how to uh, give an accurate representation of what an archway from uh, several feet behind looks like. So really the Renaissance was just an amazing accomplish era of accomplishment in terms of depicting real life. And that was the very point. Another great piece of Renaissance work, and there are so many, it's painful for me to even confine this to two in this uh, discussion of the history, is the statue of David, which was created by Michelangelo. We see here in this statue, that David looks like a real human being, a particularly attractive human being, but we see that his, his legs and his arms and his torso and his head are in exact proportions. That is really, really difficult to do. But again, it shows that above all else, the standards of the Renaissance era were re realistically depicting uh, people. And by the way, that statue of David, that stands is called the contrapposto. And apparently it is the ideal of human stances because the body's a bit curved. They're not standing flat like a, a robot or a stiff figure. You see David is kind of curved and it gives this, I think, attractive, inviting quality to the statue. 
Then we move in, and by the way, there are all these like sub periods within these. I'm just giving you the, the most important for the sake of time and for the sake of your interest, because if you get into too minute of details, well, they just get kind of boring. The next era of significance was called Rococo. Rococo. <laughs> I say it in the fun way. I love this era of art. Robert Florzak accused me of uh, being a typical chick <laughs> for admiring the Rococo era because it's kind of, uh, he says that the paintings are chick flick paintings. For instance, one of the main paintings of the Rococo era was The Swing by Fragonard. And we see this woman who is actually having an affair and she's on the swing in this plush, beautiful pink dress and it's in this garden and it's so lush and it's giving all these vibes of procreation and of sensuality. And then we see her lover who is down in the left of the painting looking up in awe of her. I love this because I think it's kind of like medieval and Renaissance art, but more relaxed. We see here that there is still a, a, a an importance placed on depicting the, the individuals and the nature as realistically as possible. But it's not as scrupulous as the Renaissance era. Like the leaves are not in such precise detail. They look a little bit like they were painted, but nevertheless, I think it upheld all of the standards that were established in previous eras, but just made it a little more fun. And as I said, sensual, um, a more sensual experience in terms of the colors and the things being depicted. Now we move on to the Impressionist era. The Impressionist era started in the 1860s and continued for a few decades. This is where I pinpoint the shift into uh, the beginnings, at least, of the modern art era. The Impressionist era was a response, actually, to these established and strict artistic conventions that were um, created in the medieval Renaissance and continued in the Rococo era. There was a group of artists, including Claude Monet and Edgar Degas, who wanted to break away from these rigid rules that were practiced by certain art institutions. Specifically, there was an institution or a salon, it was called, in France. It was an annual exhibition that was organized by the French Academy of Fine Arts. And that held significant influence over the art scene. If you were included in that annual exhibition, you were like the hot artist. But what that salon did is it only picked painters that very scrupulously adhered to the standards of realism. And so impressionist painters like Manet and Van Gogh wanted to get away from that. They wanted to create art that was still beautiful but didn't follow those traditional rules. So we see paintings like Argentois by Manet. This is uh, from 1874. And yes, you can tell that these are two human beings. You can tell that it's a man and a woman. You can tell that they're sitting on a dock and there are boats in the ocean and trees behind them. But you can really get a sense that it's a painting. They don't look particularly realistic compared to the way that, that human beings were depicted in the Renaissance era. You can see the brush strokes. And that was the point of Impressionism. It was to capture fleeting moments, to play around with light and color, to use looser and more visible brush strokes. Because instead of aiming for precise details, they just wanted to convey the overall impression of a scene. Interestingly, the term Impressionism came from one of uh, Monet's paintings. He created this painting called Impression Sunrise uh, in 1874. And a lot of people, like the members of the French Salon, who didn't like Impressionism, actually started to use it as an insult. But the insult caught on as the name of that era of art. You know another example of a label that was meant to be an insult and then caught on? Meritocracy. I think it was in the 1950s or maybe it was the 1960s, there was this British uh, columnist who was writing about the United States of America. And he wrote, you know, the Americans and the meritocracy kind of was like an insult to us. And then that, that, uh, that label actually kind of perfectly described, I think in a great way, uh, what the United States has stood for and it caught on. 
So when you're insulting someone, be careful because they may just take that label that you're putting on them and use it to uh, glorify what it is that they're doing. So we see, let's pull up Starry Night by Van Gogh. This was, uh, this is really, Van Gogh is the classic uh, impressionist uh, painter. He painted uh, Starry Night in 1889. We see the brush strokes. We see it's not rigidly adhering to certain rules. And I think that this impressionist era is really where we start to move into the modern era precisely because there is not this adherence to classical standards and forms. Let's go on to the next significant era, Cubism. And of course, the main Cubist painter was Pablo Picasso. Pablo Picasso lived in the 20th century. I think he died in like the 1970s. I just wanted to throw that out there because sometimes I think we think of Picasso as this painter long ago. It was really recently that this extremely uh, famous artist lived. Guernica is one of Picasso's most famous paintings. And here we really see the influence of Impressionism. Impressionism paved the way for artists like Picasso to play around with different forms. We see in Guernica that, that really the whole point of the painting is to not be realistic. The Rococo era was kind of realism but looser. The Impressionism era was realism but a lot looser. And then we go into cubism and, and realism is just done for. That is the very point. It just doesn't paint reality. We look here at Guernica and human beings just don't look like that. It, he died in April of 73, Picasso. Thank you, Shanzi. But human beings in this painting, they just don't look like that in real life. A horse we see on the left doesn't turn around in that way. It's impossible for the horse to turn his neck in such a matter. The proportions are off. There are these kind of bizarrely contorted limbs that we see also on the left of the painting. And it's provocative. I'm actually not insulting it. Picasso is one of my favorite modern artists, but we can't deny that the whole point of the painting is to get away from those standards. And then the last two eras are the uh, abstract era. The most famous abstract painter was Jackson Pollock. We're looking here at number one Lavender Mist, one of his paintings from 1950. And that was a invention unto itself because people didn't consider that you could create art that is a conglomeration of paint. Before we move on, I'd like to pause and tell you about my pillow. Great artists require great sleep. And great sleep is facilitated by a comfortable and good pillow. That's why I want you to go to MyPillow.com and click on the radio and podcast square. You can enter the promo code Hartman to get major discounts off of MyPillow products. I sleep on my pillows. I wear my slippers. They are really excellent products. The queen size MyPillow uh, with the discount code Hartman, you can get for $19.98. The regular price of that is $69.98 and 10 more dollars for a king size. Again, go to uh, MyPillow.com, click on the radio and podcast square, enter the promo code Hartman or call 1-800-566-6745 and enter the promo code Hartman to get a queen size MyPillow for $19.98 as well as other majorly discounted MyPillow products. Paint was used to paint something with the paint. But with Jackson Pollock and the abstract artists, paint itself now can be a form of art. And we see just loosening and lessening of established uh, standards. And then the final era is pop art. We see Andy Warhol's uh, shot Maryland's here. He created this in 1964. Again, this was upending ideas of what art could be. People didn't consider that art could be a reproduction of previous art that someone like Andy Warhol could just take pictures, I'm calling pictures art, that were taken of Marilyn Monroe and then painting over them and just styling them differently. Oh, and also, sorry, I was just kidding. I said there were two more eras. There's one final one, the minimalist era. Just continuing, we see here, just, just not painting anything realistic, not adhering to certain scrupulous standards. And even in the minimalist era, you literally don't know what this thing is. We're looking right now at the lozenge composition by Piet Mondrian, who created this in 1960. So now that we have talked about some of the history, the evolution of art, now I'm going to move into the realm of opinion. I, as I have mentioned in this show, prefer classical art to modern art. 
Let me make something clear though. I am not saying in this episode that all modern art is bad, that you shouldn't look at modern art, you shouldn't buy modern art, you shouldn't have respect for modern art. Now there are some paintings or there are some works that I'm going to show you literally like of a urinal and of a, a bucket of pee. I don't think those pieces of modern art are uh, deserving of respect. But my point is not to just paint modern art with one broad brush, no pun intended, um, and say that all of it is bad. But to me, modern art, the push that we have gone into where we uh, think that a dot on a canvas is the most profound thing to ever be created, I think that kind of reflects a greater cultural and societal malaise. Allow me to explain. I'm going to be giving you three reasons right now why I prefer classical to modern art. And they are rooted, as I said earlier, in a morality kind of values perspective. The first one, is that modern art, by definition, as I have just established in, in the history part of this episode, modern art, by definition, does not agree or hold certain objective standards of excellence and beauty. Of course, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. But there are some pieces of art, some pieces of literature, some ways of doing things that are better than others. We live in this culture now where we are so afraid to acknowledge that some things might be better than others. We look, for instance, at, at examples of this outside of art. Cambridge Public Schools in Cambridge, Massachusetts recently came out and said that they are no longer going to be having advanced math classes because it's unfair to the people who won't make it in the advanced math class. This is this whole like you can't put some people above others because it's racist and homophobic and sexist and awful. If you look at the United States Pacific Command, which is a subsection of our army, they now say that you cannot call people sergeants, even if they are sergeants, because it may make some people who aren't sergeants feel bad that they're not sergeants. Virginia, there is a public school, the Thomas Jefferson High School, which this past academic year did not acknowledge the students who qualified as National Merit Scholars for fear that it may make other students who didn't qualify feel bad. At the University of Pennsylvania in the English department, they got rid of a portrait of Shakespeare and replaced it with a uh, black feminist poet, I believe it was. And so as we see society getting away from this, uh, from, from labeling some things as better than others, as we enter this realm of relativity, that uh, truth is a subjective experience. There's your truth and there's my truth. I think that's pushing us down a really bad path. And to me, when I see some, keyword some, examples of modern art, I am reminded of this cultural rot that has seemed to infect almost every era of area. <laughs> I'm calling eras areas and areas eras, every area of society. What is aspirational about modern art? When you see that minimalist painting, the last painting that I showed you, do you get inspired looking at that? Maybe you do. I certainly don't. What are the forms that are, are being shown here? What is the talent that the artist is imparting? I mean, honestly, it's kind of a joke. <laughs> it's kind of amazing that we live in a uh, capitalist society that will literally like, where people will buy paintings that the artist probably spent 10 minutes making and call that the most profound thing. Let's compare this min minimalist painting to one of my favorite paintings, which is called Flaming June by Frederick Layton. Frederick Layton was an artist in the 19th century. He painted this in the 1880s. And so we see here this beautiful woman who is asleep. And it's just, I think, a lovely painting. And it shows that the artist has talent. And the artist is subscribing to certain standards of excellence that he um, sought to really master for the viewer's benefit. Look at this woman's dress. We can see her skin under the dress. We can see her, her breast popping through. That is exceptional artistry. How was an artist, how did that artist become able to make something that he painted look sheer? Make that dress of hers look see-through? Do you know how hard that is to accomplish? When I look at that painting, I respect the excellence that the painter was striving to achieve and show to me. 
When I look at the minimalist painting, I get no such feeling that there is excellence or an aspirational quality. Let's look at another extremely famous painting, the Arnolfini portrait by Jean van Eyck. He painted this in 1434. The color in this is spectacular. We forget that that paint is just a conglomeration of minerals. And back in the 1400s, people sat and just mixed different minerals and tried to come up with these different colors. And they did an extraordinary job. If you see that mirror in between the couple, if you zoom in, the painter is actually in the mirror, which is so clever. Also, you know, very uh, precise artistry. Look at the light coming out of the window on the left. We look at it and we forget that it's a painting. It looks so damn realistic what the artist has achieved. Even look at the window being situated where it is. That is very difficult to paint things that are at an angle and make it look realistic. Look at the seriousness in the faces of the couple. I mean, he really kind of captures and conveys human emotions. I have respect for this painter and what he was trying to con convey because I know that that painter worked really hard to get to the level of artistry to create such a masterpiece. So that is reason number one, these standards of excellence, which I think modern, uh, or cla excuse me, classical art seek to uphold where modern art kind of disdains. Reason number two, is that to me, modern art doesn't really capture the essence of a human being in the same way that classical art does. Yes, I think there's lack of, of excellence in the form of modern art paintings, but I also think there's a lack of excellence in conveying what human beings are really feeling. And specifically to me, and I wanna emphasize again, because people are gonna come at me, this is my opinion. <laughs> there's, a, uh, there's a great Real Housewife. I watch Real Housewives. I'm a complicated person. Some days I'll be looking at Rembrandt and then I'll literally go <laughs> from looking at classical art to watching trashy uh, reality television. There is this Real Housewife named Tamara Judge. Really Those who are uh, Real Housewives fans are, will know exactly who I'm talking about. And in one of um, her fights with a fellow castmate, the castmate was coming at her and she yelled, That's my opinion! That's what I want to say to people who are going to come at me. This is my opinion. I think that modern art tends to reduce human beings to our most primitive or what I call cheap emotions. Let's start actually, paradoxically, with a modern painting that I like, The Scream by Edvard Munch. He painted this in 1893. The Scream is obviously extremely famous. I like this because I think that it's provocative and it does reflect a reality or a human emotion that is kind of gory. I think we all look at that painting and we can identify with the fear and even a little bit with the mania that the central character, if that's what you can call him, is showing. So I like that piece of modern art, but I do think that modern art in general tends to emphasize a lot of the emotions that are expressed in this Edvard Munch painting. A lot of modern art to me is like a little creepy, macabre, uh, kind of like gives you this vibe of what you feel when you're just waking up in the morning and you're in that drowsy state between waking and being asleep where all kinds of things don't make sense. I feel like a lot of modern art paintings kind of depict that creepy, negative, cheap emotion vibe. Let's go to The Crying Girl, which is a piece of modern art that was created in 1963. How does this painting really capture the universal emotion of sadness? At least by my uh, judgment, it, the, the painting is more about this sexy woman who is obviously beautiful, this, this um, cartoon. She has a beautiful nose, beautiful hair, beautiful eyes. She has makeup on. It's kind of less about the crying and the sadness, and it's more about hot girl crying and being sad. And I just don't think paintings like that do a particularly good job of conveying real emotion. It cheapizes I'm coining that word, it cheapizes real sadness. Again, stuff like this isn't awful to look, at, to look at, doesn't mean that we should never look at it. But paintings like this are kind of like junk food. Junk food is filling, 
but it's not particularly nutritious. And it's not something that I think we ought to have or celebrate all of the time. Another piece of modern art from 2018, this was featured in museums, cherry picking. What is this showing? This is just like a weird display of human emotion. Again, this is what I was saying. A lot of modern art to me is kind of macabre and creepy. So is it depicting like that this mouth is hungry and this human being is throwing cherries into this person's mouth? We see that this human being has kind of a weird expression on his face. He doesn't look like he's having the best time shoveling cherries in, into this mouth. What is the point of this painting? It's just weird and creepy. You see the hair, like the facial hair around the sides of this mouth. There's nothing kind of ennobling or reflective of a shared human experience by looking at this. I just leave feeling kind of creeped out and confused. And then even when modern art shows positive emotions, happiness or delight, I also kind of think they depict it in this weird, cheap way. Let's look at tongue sticking out, which was a, um, a picture that was made a few years ago. This is like just kind of sexy and sultry and it's just, I don't know, it's just cheap. You, if you compare that to Flaming June, I think there's kind of a sexy element of Flaming June. We have this beautiful girl who's asleep and she's kind of contorted in this way that, that gives a certain aura of, uh, of uh, delight. And I just, I just think Flaming June does a much better job of conveying the sexy and the sultry than this lipstick tongue sticking out. It's just weird and cheap. Let's look at some classical paintings that I think show the full range of emotion and deal with human emotions with class and nobility. Napoleon visiting plague victims in Jaffa. So it was made in 1804. By the way, Napoleon actually did this. Isn't that amazing? He actually went and visited plague victims. Now the plague in the 1800s was not like COVID-19. The plague was like actually truly deadly. If you got it, doesn't matter how healthy you were, you were done for. So it's, it's really cool that Napoleon went and visited these individuals. But we see in this painting, again, the range of human emotions. We see Napoleon who is displaying a lot of courage by interacting with these victims. We also see Napoleon's bodyguards in the background who are looking afraid, like Napoleon, what the heck are you doing? You could infect yourself and infect all of us. We see emotions of fear and apprehension being depicted. We also see sadness and tragedy. We see plague victims who are on the floor on death's doorstep and it captures the, the scope of human feeling and gives, I think, a dignity to that human feeling in a way that a lipstick tongue sticking out just doesn't, according to my judgment. And then here we have from the 1500s, a painting called Christ Looking Up. This is amazing. This shows sadness. You can really see the sadness in Christ's face, but you can also see a look of hope and a sense of knowing. That to me is just a magnificent, really deep analysis of human emotion. Sometimes classical art depicted more primitive behavior or more low level, cheap emotions. For instance, if you look at the Garden of Heavenly Delights by Hermonymus Bosch from the 1500s, we see a lot of figures in the middle who are kind of uh, like straddling the uh, distinction between man and animal. We see these hedonist creatures who are doing some creepy things. They're dancing. One of them is doing a circus act. They, there's obviously nudity everywhere, there's polygamy. But the point is of this painting, it is to mock hedonism in these primitive emotions and behavior. The point is not to celebrate or legitimize them. We see because yes, in the center, there are all these hedonists, but on the left of the painting, there's a depiction of Adam and Eve. And on the right of the painting, there's a depiction of hell. The point is to show the consequences of our more primitive nature, not to just celebrate them. And then reason number three, why I prefer classical over modern art, why I think we should focus and appreciate classical art more than modern, is because I think that a lot of modern art makes a mockery of the viewer. 
Let's look at the Nick Cave exhibit at the Guggenheim. I actually went to this exhibit myself. I didn't realize that it would be this bad. I just thought the Guggenheim had good work and I was wrong. This is from 2023, I went a few months ago. It's literally just a compilation of trash. And the point, I guess, of the exhibit, the stated point is that using non-conventional art pieces can be a kind of resistance to these bigoted standards that were once expected of art artists. I think that kind of makes a mockery of the people going in and, and, and looking at that piece of art because you know what it shows? I'm sorry to say it, but it shows the artist really doesn't respect you as a viewer. If they respected you as a viewer, I think they would spend a lot of time really trying to create a good, noble product. They wouldn't just throw together a, a bunch of pieces of trash and try to sell that to you as the most profound thing you will ever see in your life. It's the same thing with walking into an art exhibit and you see all of these people ooing and aahing at a canvas that just has one stroke of paint on it. I think the artist may be intending to mock the viewer, to see how many people, how many white, affluent, overeducated, liberal can come in and stare at really a piece of trash, something that requires no talent, and think that it is the greatest thing since sliced bread. And then we see the fountain, which is the urinal, somehow passed as art. This is from 1917. And then the final image I'll show you today is of this uh, piece called Pissed. It is by this transgender artist who collected 200 gallons of his own urine and this is a reading from his website. Pissed is a collection of all of the liquid excreted by the artist in the 200 days following the Trump administration's 2017 rollback of an Obama era executive order allowing transgender students to use the bathroom matching their chosen identities. Basically, uh, the point of it is to show, quote, the physical burden placed on an individual body when bathroom access is restricted by discriminatory policy. It is just embarrassing at this point that an author or that an artist would think that people would come in and see it. And it's embarrassing that people do come in and see it. Say what you want about classical art. You may not like it as much as I, but you know that you are not being made a fool of as the viewer. You know that that artist really wanted to create something magnificent for you. You cannot say the same about a 200 gallon jar of one's own urine. That's my show for you today. I hope you appreciated the history as well as my three reasons for preferring classical over modern art. If you disagree with me, I welcome disagreement. Comment down below, or you can also email me at julie at julie-hartman.com. I will see you all soon. Take care and be well. <laughs>